But uh, I welcome everybody to the NERSC data seminar. We are really excited today to have our colleague from Oak Ridge uh, here with us, Ahmad Karimi, to give us a talk on uh, characterizing machine learning IO workloads on leadership scale HPC systems. We um, we saw uh, the you know that this talk being presented or you know that it was going to be presented at Mascots 2021, and so we. We're like, oh, we have to get this here at uh, LBL because I think um, the work is really interesting. So uh, Ahmad comes to us um, from the analytics and AI methods at scale group at uh, NCCS at the OLCF at Oak Ridge. Um, and he is an HPC operational data scientist. Um, at, uh, at, uh, specializing in uh, characterizing HPC IO patterns. So. With that, I'm gonna let you go ahead and present your work. Thanks, Ahmad. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and hello everyone. Uh, I will turn off my video for the talk. So just to have enough bandwidth for our like slides. So as already mentioned today, the topic of my uh, presentation is characterizing machine learning IO workloads on leadership scale HPC system. And Arnab and Faye were my like co-authors on this work. And it was presented at Mascot last month. And in this talk, I will start with first introduction and background, and then a brief description about Darshan, which is an HPC IO characterization tool. I think many of us would know that, but it will be good to like, uh, describe it here briefly so that everybody knows that. And then I will talk about a method that we used for extracting machine learning workloads out of all the workloads that, that Darshan captured. And then the analysis that we did on those extracted workload and then finally conclusion. So a little bit of uh, introduction. So as we know that uh, HPC workloads are always evolving, especially when we have more and more of AI and machine learning jobs, which uh, which has uh, like a uh, different IO, which exhibit different IO patterns than the traditional workloads like simulation and visualization and maybe computation and those kinds of workloads. Because we know it has a distinct pattern like HPC. First, we load the data and then we process it and then train it. So this has its own distinct pattern. And then the work that we did was, uh, I mean, the workload that we used were collected from Summit, which is also called OLCF4 machine. And it has two storage systems. One is parallel file system, which is IBM GPFS, IBM uh, GPFS, uh, and it has a different name, Spectrum or something. And then the other is like the burst buffer, which is like node local uh, storage. So every node has its own burst buffer. And then the analysis that we performed were uh, like the data that we had, we kind of classified based on science domain from where the jobs were being executed or the size of the job based on the number of nodes and the temporal trends that we observed over a period of like a, for a one year. This in this image, uh, like we, we can see how the HPC machines have evolved at Oak Ridge National Lab and uh, over a decade and a half. And then we see uh, that we have summit here. And especially as these machines have evolved, so as the workloads on these machines, right? And especially like with the with more and more of machine learning workloads running, they 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 have their own IO pattern. So uh, that was the motivation. Like we want to see how what what are the characteristics of these kinds of workloads. So for this task, we used uh, Darshan, which is an like well-known HPC IO characterization tool, uh, I think developed at Argon National Lab for IBM Gene, IBM Blue Gene series computers, and but but it's now very popular and is being used at different HPC machines across the nation and even beyond. So for it, the Darshan has like different instrumentation modules. So for this work, we have used uh, three different modules like POSIX, MPI, and a standard IO. So for Darshan, like how it does, so 
for all the ranks, I mean, when a job is submitted, it's it's running on multiple ranks, right? So it will record the uh, uh, like IR traces for all the ranks uh, independently. And when the job finishes, they are collectively written to one single log file. So that's how it does. So for example, MPI IO would record the traces whenever MPI file read or MPI file write functions are called. Similarly, POSIX would uh, record for read and write function calls and a standard IO for, for fprintf, fscanf and others. And yeah, and now here I'm like showing a sample IO trace or a part of a sample IO trace because these traces can be very big, right? So uh, the, the different features that we are attributes that we see here are module, which is like, again, the instrumentation that we use, for example, POSIX, MPI, or standard IO, then it has a rank on which processor it's running, then record ID, which is kind of the hash value of the file name. And then counters uh, shows the different metrics, which are like collected at Darsh by Darshan, then the values of these metrics. Then file name. So I have kind of um, uh, hidden the file name, full path of the file name because just I thought it would be better. And then, so this file name is like really important for our work because this is what we use to find whether a job is a machine learning job or not a machine learning job. And then there are some other attributes as well. So. So we will we'll come back to this again when we talk about how we how we extract machine learning workloads. So for this work, we use the data set from, uh, uh, I, I mean, for workloads which ran on Summit from January 2020 to December 2020, like one year of data. And in total, we recorded like 300,000, or we, we uh, this Darshan recorded 300,000 jobs which is like not all the jobs because of the limitations of Darshan, it cannot record all the jobs. So this was roughly around 40%. And out of these jobs, we found that around 25,000 of the jobs uh, are machine learning jobs. There could be more, but from the method that we used, we could find out 25,000 jobs. And the way we did it was that we used, so primarily we, we kind of, uh, we were looking for, not we were looking for, like we found a method by which we can at least extract those machine learning jobs which have used like Python or R libraries. And then how do we do that is first we uh, like list down the uh, list keywords. And this, these keywords are based on, primarily based on the programming languages. Like if, if a machine learning job is being run by Python, on, on Python, then what are the different libraries that it could use? Or if it's, being run by R, then what are the different libraries that it could use? So, so from that, we, we kind of came up with these keywords. And then also we kind of manually like also observe the data set for one month, uh, over one month for, for like logs. Obviously it, it's a huge log, so we cannot go all, but then we wanted to see, are we covering uh, like most of these keywords. So yes, we, we were covering, but as I mentioned again, right, there could be more keywords as well, but at least we, uh, we are starting with something where we can uh, explicitly, oh, okay, know that these are machine learning jobs compared to like the other jobs, which could be uh, traditional workloads. Yeah. So, so these, these keywords, the ones that are listed here, what we do we we then like go back to this data and then map these uh, with the file name. If for a one job we see any of these uh, like file name, which includes the file path as well, matching with these keywords here, we would say that that workload is a machine learning workload, and that's how. So we would go with all, uh, we would scan all the three hundred thousand jobs, and out of that we found that. 25,000 jobs are the ones which use, uh, which has files uh, matching with I, any one of these patterns, at least any one of these patterns. So that's that's like, I, I would say the crux of the work that we did, like kind of come up with a method to, to, uh, to identify what are the jobs which are machine learning job, because unless until we don't know that, we will not be able to, uh, you know, like, uh, like study about the, uh, uh, the ML workloads 
or or the other other way could be to you know like run a job and we know that this is a machine learning job so go and analyze that so that's one way to do but we want to do we wanted to do cross sectional study like running for all the jobs that are there on uh, and that, that ran on summit. So for us, so then now our analysis begins. Now from here onwards, we will have all of the analysis part and some of the results are, are here. So for example, we want, the so first thing that we did was we wanted to see the distribution of ML jobs. And we found that out of all the domain signs that are there, and I think there are around 30 or something, uh, only nine of them were like using uh, machine learning uh, ML jobs from obviously from the method that we used and then how the unique users and unique applications uh, distribute. So physics has like physics has like maximum number of users and application. For example, computer science also has like maximum users and application. And then the other one is for oh, just this hide. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, and then the biology is the third one. So these three are the, and especially computer science and biology has a major contribution of the machine learning workload. And when we see, we also know that, bi like bioinformatics is one of the area, and then computer science is the other area which would do that. Hey, Ahmad, um, can I pause you for just a second to answer a question? Um, yes. uh, so from Kadidia, um, are the file names user defined? So. Uh, from from your previous slide. Uh, uh, oh, these file names? Right, right. So oh, those are all user defined files, but you're also tracking uh, so, other keywords. Yeah. So if I if I understood the uh, like question correctly, it's like the question is like how do we see these file names or who is defining these file names, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these file names are so I don't know like who is defining that it could be from the libraries itself, it could be from the user data, or it could be from the source application as well, so there could be three different sources. So, for example, I'm running a like a, a machine learning job right so I would use let's say train.py. So that would come here, but then train train.py would import TensorFlow, right? So that would come here as well. So if you see here, these are the full file names. So uh, we, we see repetitions here because for every count, because we have the counter values for uh, our, for we have different counter values for one file. That's why we see repetitions here, but we would see train.py and it's different counter values. Then we would see TensorFlow, dot pi let's say then their counter value and let's say if there is a data called data dot uh parky then we will see that as well here that's my understanding yeah okay so, yeah. and and you have darshan running system wide right it's all yeah. always running behind the scenes yeah it's always running and yeah. can users disable it like they can disable like alt d like a module unload kind of thing yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's a, it's a module so which is like loaded by default if we don't mm -hmm. want it we can unload that okay module. got it thanks yeah and then there are different kinds of uh like uh, darshan modules i mean different with different functionality for example darshan dxt is the one which usually which is usually not turn loaded but if we want like a real time or or temporal data information then we can load that and it will have much more a uh, detailed data set but usually that's not turned on did that clear the uh, or answer the question yes thank you thank you yeah, yeah. so yeah coming back to our presentation uh so yeah, so three different. So these were the three different domains which had like maximum contribution to ML jobs. And then, so that now the other thing is we wanted to see what are the job size. I mean, the number of nodes that these jobs are using. So for this, we made the three different classification like flagship jobs, medium jobs, and small jobs. And how do we classify them? It's based on the uh, the, the scheduling policy of of. Uh, of the summit. So summit has a scheduling policy for a different number of nodes. For example, if a job is running for like uh, on nodes from one to 45, it will have wall time of maximum of two hours. So we classified those as ML jobs, sorry, as small jobs. And then the other jobs, 
that we classified as uh, medium jobs are running on the nodes 46 to 921. And again, there is like a there there are two categories in here for smaller for a smaller number of nodes, it will have a maximum wall time of six hours. And for the larger category, a larger number of nodes, it will have 12 hours. And then flagship jobs are like more than 922 nodes. So these are the different, different categories here. And we want to see the distribution of each of these nine domain signs uh, or contribution of ML jobs uh, across these nine domains and nine science domain. And then we see that, so let's start with uh, the small scale um, are, are the flagship jobs, right? So we see that for flagship jobs, we see computer science and physics jobs as a major, major contribution and also biology. And then we see that for medium scale jobs, we see biology has the maximum number of contribution. For small scale jobs, we see biology, physics, and computer science. So this kind of makes uh, one more thing that for, for like flagship jobs, use, users are usually running, you know, like small scale jobs first, which is kind of understood as well. But this is kind of giving us a qualitative perspective as well, that since these three domains are the major contributors in medium and flagship scale jobs, they're also the maximum contributors here. That means these jobs were first, uh, we can like kind of derive this conclusion that okay, these jobs were first ran on a small scale and then now they are running. Uh, when they want to run it at a production scale, they, they then, I, I mean, they, then they run on the large scale, whether it's medium or flagship. Then now we also wanted to see the, the file system that these jobs are using, right? That's one of the like kind of the important thing we want to see, whether these jobs are really using uh, the burst buffer or not. And, and if they're using in what percentage. So that was one of the things. So that this is uh, surprising to us in the beginning that out of all these nine science domains, only four of these are using burst buffer and the others are, so there could be different reasons, right? The, the one of the thing could be the, the jobs or, or the, and the workflow that are designed for them may not be easier for them to move it to burst buffer. But then also maybe they are not aware of the burst buffer or uh, it may not be comfortable for the other science domains to use uh, the burst buffer. So that was like one thing that on a limited number of users are using burst buffer. Uh, and even, even in those science domains, like for example, computer science and biology, the amount of burst buffer jobs are less compared to the jobs which are running on GPFS. Oh, so I, I and I think it will be also good to define like how do we how do I define what are burst buffer jobs? So so again, like when we go to the file system, so I, I mean to the data, there is also like uh, uh, there is one more field here there. Uh, which is like mount path or something where we see whether it's like what's the what's the file system whether it's burst buffer or whether it's GPFS. So if there is a file in in all the files for a job, if, if there is even one file which has used burst buffer, we will call it as a burst buffer jobs. So so burst buffer jobs can have files from GPFS as well, but it will have at least one file from the burst buffer system file system, whereas uh, GPFS jobs are exclusively GPFS jobs, like they do not use burst buffer at all. And then there are other file system, but I primarily focused on these two file systems. So is this the, the distribution for um, all jobs or for the ML jobs? For ML jobs, yeah. All, all the analysis that I will be talking from here on are for 25,000 ML jobs that we extracted from 300,000 ML jobs. Yeah, that was the, the origin of my question. It looks like on this scale, you have a lot more than, no, it's a long scale. So maybe it, that is 25,000, okay. On the previous slide? No, right here, this, it looks like you have two, two entries here that are around 10,000. So it wasn't. Sh it looked like for a moment it looked like a lot more mm -hmm. than twenty thousand, but it's a log scale. So the yeah, the ones that scale. are a little bit smaller are actually quite a bit smaller. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Makes sense. So Steve has a question about collecting data for jobs, reading from node local storage, but I think it's also maybe, could you explain what burst buffer means on Summit? Because it means something different for us yeah. Yeah, locally. So, so burst yeah, buffer is node local, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a little bit different from NERSC. Not a little bit. I mean, it's a different architecture. Yeah. So I in NERSC, I, I think it's a Lester file system. But here we have like a, a like a local storage within the node. So and which has like uh, which is NVMe SSD based. So I don't know how it's on NERSC. So so that's the difference here. We don't have a, like a separate uh, uh, like uh, I mean the storage server for. For buzz buffer, every node has its own uh, local storage. Is it a terabyte, or what was the size of the burst oh, buffer per node? Uh, 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 I, I remember. Uh, yeah, it, it's in terabytes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, and so they are like individual like nodes, but I think when when we run, uh, I'm I'm not sure about this, but I think when we run. Uh, like a let's say a job on five nodes, right? So I think they will make a network, and we make we can distribute the data across like different um, uh, those five nodes, even even though we call them node local. But I'm not hundred percent sure about that part. Yeah. So yeah. So again, like we now we want to see the distribution of jobs. Um, on two file system, but also across the different uh, job sizes, of flagship jobs, medium jobs, and small jobs. So, so here and, at, and so here we see something different from the usual trend, and which is like the computer science jobs are are running on. There are like first of all, there are very few jobs which are on the flagship compared to the other jobs. And then, but but the trend here is that we see more of the computer science jobs on Burst Buffer than on uh, GPFS, and the other science domains they do not at all use the uh, Burst Buffer when 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 they are running the jobs in flagship. However, we see, but because again these are like the fewer numbers, so that could be one reason. But when we see on the medium sized jobs, uh, then we see that they. All four science domain use buzz buffer, just like the small jobs. So this is one one of the thing that uh, why like they would not use buzz buffer on the flagship jobs. We don't know the reason, but that's one of the finding here. And and then we want to like characterize these ML jobs also based on you know like how much uh, what's the whether they are read intensive, write intensive, or read write intensive. Usually we think that they are read intensive, but they but that's not the case always. That's what we found. And uh, first first of all, we define like what are read intensive, write intensive, and read write jobs. So we we use this equation here, uh, like read bytes minus write bytes over read bytes plus write bytes. And if the value of this uh, like number of read bytes, uh, this equation lies in the range of minus one to minus 0. 0.5. That means there are overwhelming number of right, in, right bytes. And then we will call it the right intensive jobs. Then similarly for others as like, if the, if the value of this equation lies from 0. 0.5 to one, then we will call it read intensive because there are overwhelmingly number of read bytes. And if the result is near around zero, which is like 0.5 to 5, we call it as both read and write. So when we like distribute, so this is a density plot, which we show, which shows the, the denser the plot, uh, the, the region is, the more number of data points are there. And it shows that, uh, that for GPFS and for buzz buffer file system, there's a different trend here. For, for buzz buffer, usually we see that it's, it's like, uh, um, divided into like multi-model. Like for example, whether uh, it's like uh, either the jobs are read intensive, that means the number of bytes are very small here, or the number of bytes are uh, bytes written are very high and then very small read bytes. So this is something different from what we see here on GPFS. So one thing, the, for GPFS, the number of bytes which are, sorry, number of jobs which are in read-write uh, range 
uh, are far more greater where we don't see anything here rather other than few few sample here. So that's one thing different. And when we see it quantitatively, this is how it looks that that read write jobs are very small here, but we do have uh, significant numbers here. Uh, and then the other finding is that uh, GPFS like has computer science and chemistry has I still higher number of read intensive jobs on GPFS. So there are opportunities if they could move to bus buffer, they will have like a better performance. Now, the other thing that we want to see is that usually, uh, or, or we know that GPFS or the file systems are good, are not good or suited for small calls, right? For them, we have designed bus buffer. And if, if the job has that kind of a IO access pattern, then they should, uh definitely use buzz buffer so that's what that's what we wanted to see like how are the what are the range of these job uh, these io calls and then again we see that uh that overwhelming number of uh, calls are very small like less than one megabyte compared to the other 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 call sizes and if these call size are are done on buzz buffer it would be it would give better IO performance. So that's uh, another thing. Again, from the data set, like we don't get like less than one megabyte. Like there are far finer uh, size of uh, bin, but we combine all of those bins into one category of less than one megabyte. And these are pretty consistent across all the science domain, but in few cases we do see like some bigger numbers even in larger bins. But it's still the percentage. If we see, it's still like very high percentage in less than one bit, one megabytes. And, and the back, the reason there's fractional values because they're averaged across all the runs within that domain. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I think they are not average value. These are like aggregate values. I just was trying to understand how a call could be. Fractional, so I was thinking it must be some kind of average or normalization. Oh, also these are not fraction, right? If you if you expand these number, so no, this but look at the one greater than one gig, it's two point four eight. Oh, so oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, so yeah these are average. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Okay. So I think we aggregated for one job, like all the calls, and then if there are let's say hundred jobs in that call, then we would take the mean of that. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. And, and not, not in this slide, I'm showing that distribution of jobs having persistent files. And when we say persistent files here, we meant that uh, uh, how many of the files are that are ri being written to the buzz buffer are then being persisted to the persistent file system, for example, um, parallel file system here, or, or the other way around. If, if we are seeing uh, uh, files on the buzz buffer, then what fraction of files are being copied? If, if we are seeing a files on, uh, on GPFS, then what fraction of those files are being copied to um, buzz buffer and then being read from there? So that's the, like, the idea here, like looking for the common files on both file system during a job. So, so and we have divided in based on the science domain and then based on the size of the job here. So, uh, I think for 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 biology for almost all science domain we don't see much of the activity here other than the computer science which has like so let me first also explain these bars here so I think it will be uh, make it more uh, more like easy to understand so we see a um, blue bar here which is write write re read intensive files and then we see read intensive common files again I call it common whether it's like whether for read or for write, right? If we see a common file on both file system, then we will call it a common file. So there are, so for example, there are no jobs in biology which are, uh, which are common, but there are files which are like read intensive files. So, and for, then for write intensive, let's see for write intensive, there are files, uh, there are jobs and then there are equal number of jobs which have like common files as well. So 
if if a job is using a uh, if a job has like if a, if a biology has only one write intensive job then that job is sharing its data on both file system it could be whether the file has been written and then moved to the gpfs or the whether the file has been first moved to the burst buffer and then read from uh, burst buffer so that's how we will see these plots here and it's the idea is to see like how the different domain sciences are using the file system so so we don't see uh, so much of uh, like a diversity here uh, but uh, only in computer science domain and and when we see this across the uh, like the size of the jobs it's like uh, flagship medium and a small we see much more diversity here and one of the reason could be it could be because like now com computer science jobs are dominating in flagship right and they will also have some percentage of the jobs in these two categories so i think this pattern is being reflected here so that's that's the reason i think one of the for or, or an explanation for these kinds of plot for this behavior of the plot and then now moving further and now so now we saw the number of jobs right having the common files but we also wanted to see the uh, like the number of bytes that are being copied so if if we have a like a uh like a a, a file which is being written again and again right but it, if it's being copied only once to the parallel file system so is that is there are we able to track those kinds of activities so that was the idea behind looking at uh the number of bytes here what we are looking at so for example for this read plot we are looking at total number of bytes in a uh in a job and then total number of by bus a bytes read and then the total number of bytes persisted so total number of bytes read and burst by and number of bytes read from the burst buffer are almost same but then none of those are persisted so i so here what we can see from the pre come if, if we compare it with the previous figure that it kind of uh, support that that if, if we are only looking at the file it kind of gives us a general idea of the number of bytes as well there is no such difference that between the number of bytes and number of files so again we see, we don't see much of a uh, like a different pattern here they all behave different similarly like we will see a similar uh, um, these two box have high value but then the persistence box have less value in these three domains other than computer science and the pattern is similar here as well these are all zeros because there are no jobs for for write or or something yeah and now uh so now we saw the mm, different behaviors of the uh, of jobs and files uh, on both file systems right and now uh, we want to see their average behavior on different file system in terms of uh, bandwidth so some of the things are like kind of known but it's kind of giving us a, a quantitative value than what we already assume for example we see that burst buffer has a higher performance than than gpfs in terms of like megabytes per second for read and write oh sorry like this has a bigger value right so overall we saw that read byte uh, sorry read jobs has five times better performance on burst buffer compared to gpfs and write has four times better performance compared to gpfs and then we also kind of divided uh, distributed the data across the science domains and saw that uh, are these behavior consistent so in so they are kind of similar uh, across the uh, like i mean the if, if we compare their mean values like it's almost similar there are some variations but we cannot uh, like just conclude anything from there and so is for for right right jobs here and we see some zeros here because there are no jobs for that category so that that was like the performance and the cross-sectional view of all the machine learning jobs that we could find found out from the uh, darshan traces and now here we are trying to show the how that are there like uh, machine learning jobs evolving and by evolving i mean are we seeing more and more of machine learning jobs 
uh, on summit over a period of one year that we that we were analyzing and these are the trends that we find so for example if we see uh, the cdfs of machine learning jobs that are running on gpfs then we see that there are uh, mm, okay and before that uh, th these red lines shows the 50 percent of the jobs right 50% of the jobs are on the left and 50% of the jobs are on the right. And the X axis is the, is the month. So we start with January, February, March, and go on until December here. So if the, if the red line is in between, uh, for example, mm, so something like that, that means the 50% of the jobs ran in the first half of the year and the next 50% of the job ran in the other half, next half uh, of the year. So, so if we if we keep that those points in the mind, then we will see that uh, most of the red points uh, lie towards the latter part of the year, and that means like in September, October, November. That that shows that more and more of the machine learning loads uh, or jobs are running uh, are in the later part of the year, or we see increasingly large number of machine learning jobs uh, jobs as we as the system matures. And but but there are some some uh, I mean anomalies to it as well. We will talk about that. For example, so but before that, for example, we see computer science jobs. They are like that. We see the trend is rising, and and so is the case for other 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 science domains. But we see some of these sharp rises as well, and. Even though we see us, we are seeing this this kind of a trend here, but this also attributes, but we cannot take it as a face value. And by that I mean uh, that there are like very few users who 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 ran the job during this month, right? And then nobody used across the other period. But it's still uh, like so we cannot say anything conclusively right now from this data. But we still see that, okay, like these things happen at the later part of the year. That means more and more jobs are, we can foresee more ML jobs being run. And then I talk about, I will talk about this anomalous behavior here. And this is for computer science and for burst buffer, like where 50% of the jobs ran in January itself. And the, 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 so when we saw this plot, then the discussion that we had was that it was, uh, and I'm not saying it conclusively because it's um, just based on the discussion that we had is that there were like lots of test run for this case, this scenario, that's where we see uh, lots of jobs uh, which were executed in January itself. So which is like different from the usual uh, pattern that we see. So now coming on to the conclusion of the work. So we, we can like say in general, there is a continuous rise in machine learning workloads. We see large number of small files, uh, jobs, uh, or we see large number of jobs using small files, which can, uh, if we move them to the burst buffer, or if they were, if were running on the burst buffer, they will get better performance. Many users do not use burst buffer, which there could be different reasons to it, but if it's a really, but if we associate it with the ease of use, then there is a need for a architecture design, like we should come up with a user-friendly solution. So that's one of the way to make it much more user-friendly for, not for just for the computer science, people from the computer science background, but for other users as well. And Mm, there's a need for to develop a generic model. I think that's what we are working on. So as I mentioned in the beginning, right, we extracted 25,000 workload by certain math method. And that method is not exhaustive. Like we could, we might have missed different workloads there because if, if they didn't fall into those keywords, then like working on a model which can bring, uh, which can like detect even unseen like even the day, even the jobs which are not from those keywords and then the uh, the other thing that was that we think we we should have done or we want to do is that compare these patterns with the other workloads i mean which we call as a traditional workload right and then we can actually come see if there are pattern difference and then and if there is then what are the different pattern or how we can quantify those differences 
So these are the things for we are working on. That's, that's for the presentation today. Thank you very much. And I want to acknowledge the uh, OLCF and DOE for, this, for the support. Thanks, Ahmad. That was great. Um, we, we have, uh, well, so um, uh, we definitely have time for some questions. So you can unmute yourself to ask questions or raise your hand. But we, we have one question in the chat still remaining from Annette. And it was about uh, um, how much of the behavior you see um, you know, is a response to messaging and user training. And, and I think this is the burst buffer utilization. Um, you know, so for example, is it possible that people have been cued to use the burst buffer specifically when their job involves a lot of reads or a lot of writes? So uh, I, I didn't understand the question. So what is the question? Well, uh, so the question is, you know, the utilization in the burst buffer, how much do you think that is based on, you know, user training and kind of what the facility is saying to users about how best to use the burst buffer versus a particular user preference, like they've come up to come to it on their own. Yeah, so uh, we, we I think this work doesn't cover that part because mm -hmm. we were like looking at the cross sectional study, right? Not looking at the individual job or for the user, how they're performing. So, so right now we can just say that for a particular science domain, like what was the pattern by by one of the slides where I presented the number of smaller bytes read are were far much greater than the, for the other larger calls. But saying that how much of that was for training or for based on the user preference, I don't think like that is covered in this work. Yeah. Do you get a sense of it? Do you know, do you know um, maybe what kind of training the OLCF does regarding burst buffer usage? Mm, no, uh, I cannot say that. <laughs> Sorry. Means I do not know yet. Yeah. 